So uh, good morning, welcome. I'm glad to see all of you here. Uh, my name is Tom Broadwater and I'm an associate teacher at Columbus uh, KTC. I'm really happy to welcome you here. It's uh, good to see you in this space. And I've <clears throat> asked Tanya to keep all of our faces uh, visible uh, for a couple of reasons. One is we so rarely get together <laughs> physically as a group, and it's just nice to see faces uh, uh, during this uh, pandemic. It's just really cool to be able to see so many faces. Um, I uh, Again, I want to welcome you to this space. Uh, I cleaned up my uh, house for you. I uh, <clears throat> took a shower, shaved, got all cleaned up. Uh, in anticipating uh, all of you being here. Uh, I actually got clean clothes on, got my Zen. Uh, so I'm all, I'm all set uh, to, uh, <laughs> to, to be with you. Um, so I'm really glad you, you came this morning. Um, this is a workshop. Um, it might be good if we silence ourselves. I don't know uh, what that, there we go. Uh, so anyway, I, I do uh, thank you for being here. Uh, this is a workshop. And what that means different from a teaching is um, you're gonna have to do some work. <laughs> and uh, there'll be some exercises throughout this uh, teaching. And uh, to the extent you can get into the exercises, uh, put yourself into them, uh, that's uh, that's going to be really helpful. And I think a great deal of the success of this workshop will be the result, not of what I say, but what you do, uh, particularly in the workshop. Um, there'll be, uh, we'll have a small break. So if people need refills on their tea or coffee, they could do that. Uh, I've... <clears throat> I've made sure that we have lots of time for uh, discussion. Uh, you may have a personal story that you would like to share. And I want a lot of time for that. <clears throat> if you came thinking we might talk about the Bardo, we really won't today. I had a discussion with Lama Kathy yesterday. And that whole Bardo teaching is, is sort of a standalone. Uh, that what we're going to talk about is dying and uh, anticipating our death. And I think that's enough to cover <laughs> in one day. I don't know that we need to go beyond that. There'll also be time for questions. And I'm really, really happy that Lama Kathy is joining us because she can, uh, she can help us with those questions. Uh, and uh, be part of the discussion. So again, I want to thank Lama Kathy for being here. So the topic is uh, compassion at the time of death. Uh, by the way, if this is not the class you're supposed to be in, you can exit now. <laughs> I'll tell you a quick story. I, uh, Lama Kathy sent me to a uh, to Capital University a couple of years ago, and I went into to a classroom. And I went into the classroom, sat down. The bell rang, the students were there, and I stood up and I started talking about uh, introducing them to uh, Buddhism. And about five minutes into my talk, the teacher, who was a physics teacher, walked in and he said, what are you doing here? <laughs> I'd gone into the wrong class, but these students were so polite. <laughs> they, they, and I guess maybe they didn't know what they were you know, what was going on anyway, but no one, no one raised an issue about that. So um, make sure you are in the right class. This class is, uh, again, uh, compassion at the time of death. Um, I'm not the greatest teacher in the world. I will, I will tell you that right off the bat. But what I teach is the Dharma and the Dharma is liberating. So I really ask you to listen to my words and forgive any poor delivery that uh, I might have. So let's begin uh, in a way that Ken Holmes, who's a great teacher uh, from Sami Ling, 
uh, in Scotland. He now lives in France. He always begins uh, Dharma talks in this way. He says, there's three things you need to, to listen to a Dharma talk. <clears throat> the first thing is you have to have a big mind, which is to say, include everybody. All the people think that uh, you're doing this for everyone, particularly the people you know, because they're the ones that are teaching you what human beings do. So keep them in mind during this talk. Try to cultivate a loving mind, a mind that uh, wants to benefit and be compassionate and loving to all beings. And finally, uh, come with a happy mind. I mean, I woke up this morning, I'm alive. I mean, that is a precious gift, just waking up. Sometimes that hits me more acutely than others. Sometimes, you know, you just get out of the again. But sometimes you wake up, gosh, I woke up, I'm alive. And the second thing is, we're alive and we are at a time when Dharma still lives. And uh, if we take the lessons of the Dharma, they're in our hearts and they will have effects for the rest of our lives. So for all those reasons, uh, we should have a happy mind. So big mind, loving mind, happy mind. To uh, sort of set our direction, I'm going to say a few prayers. Uh, refuge prayer, it's called Refuge and Bodhicitta. That basically sets our intention and it clearly establishes our motivation. <clears throat> Kimba Kata Rinpoche said, when uh, we are in the process of dying, that our constant companions in this process are the objects of our refuge, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. But he also included in that our teachers, our gurus, uh, and if we practice a, a deity practice, our yin. So all of those folks, we should think of them as above our head, accompanying us uh, through this journey, uh, this journey towards death. So, oh, so uh, thank you, we put the prayer up. So uh, let's say it uh, together. Until I reach enlightenment, I take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. So the merit of accomplishing the six perfections, may I achieve awakening for the benefit of all beings. Until I reach enlightenment, I take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Noble Sangha. So the merit of accomplishing the six perfections, may I achieve awakening for the benefit of all beings. Until I reach enlightenment, I take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. To the merit of accomplishing the six perfections, the six virtues, may I achieve awakening for the benefit of all beings. I will say one other prayer. You don't have, you don't have to put it up there, so, uh, Tanya. May all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings never be separated from supreme happiness, which is without suffering. May they remain in boundless peace free from attachment to those close to them and rejection of others. Okay. So again, today's topic is compassion at the time of death. Actually, this topic was uh, inspired by Lama Kathy. Um, 
I wrote up a, a piece about what I was going to do today. And um, she really fixed it up really nice. She made it uh, much more uh, appealing. And uh, I love that title, uh, Compassion at the Time of Death, because that fits perfectly with what we're going to talk about today. Because what we're going to talk about is our experience of what it will be like as we die. And uh, it's really important at that time that we have compassion for ourselves because it can involve suffering. And that compassion not only go, extends to ourselves, but to all beings. And why? Because all beings are going to die. They, like us, are going to suffer. And so we need to have, um, we need to have to compassion. So the title recognizes we experience pain at the prospects of dying. We may have some difficulty in this passage from life to rebirth. So we recognize that suffering, that difficulty. We see it. We don't, we don't shy away from it. We don't avert our eyes from it. We look at it. We recognize it, but then what we do is we bring it into our hearts, dissolving our pain and our difficulties into our wisdom hearts. And by that strange alchemy of a wise heart, that suffering gets transformed into something very beautiful and useful on this journey. If you remember nothing else in this workshop, try to remember this, something that Changa Rinpoche said. He said, death and dying is a journey of the mind. It's a journey of the mind. And we don't wanna mess up that journey. We want to have a nice journey. We want to travel efficiently. We want to get to a nice destination. As Kimpo Carter Rinpoche has said, death to rebirth is an intro interval of possibility. So once the death process are dying, has commenced, we have an enormous possibility. And so we want to try to take advantage of that opportunity, that possibility. In uh, preparing uh, for this talk, I, um, I'm going to use The Great Path of Awakening by John M. Control, the Great. Uh, and a couple of, of, of quotes from uh, No Time to Lose by Tim, Pema Chodron. <clears throat> but basically, most of the talk is from The Great Path of Awakening, a wonderful book. Um, I spent uh, with Lama Kathy probably six months just going over this uh, book. Um, it's, uh, if you have the opportunity to, uh, it's hard to do it by yourself. It's best to do it with a companion. And even better if you have someone that has themselves uh, reflected and worked on it. But anyway, uh, we're going to use the great path uh, of awakening. And I've structured this workshop around five forces or powers that we use at the time of death. And they're laid out in the great path of awakening. These instructions uh, were inspired by uh, a teacher by the name of Atisha. He was a, an 11th century monk. His story is really uh, incredible. Uh, usually in these talks, uh, when, uh, when uh, we use tr uh, traditional um, Tibetan teaching, we give a long biography of our, uh, of our author or the, who inspired the teaching. Um, but we don't have that kind of time today. All I'm going to tell you is, uh, 
a teacher was he was a pretty wild character. Uh, he went from India to Sumatra. He spent 12 years there just, just on the notion that he would, he heard a phrase uh, and it was uh, from this teacher in Sumatra. He said, I gotta go, I gotta go hear what this fellow says. And he spent 12 years there just learning. Now, you know, travel these days is not quite so problematic, although we do have the COVID, but back then it was like impossible. But he went to Sumatra, spent 12 years, came back to India. From India, he went to Tibet all with the idea of, first of all, learning and then teaching. I mean, that's uh, it's pretty inspiring. He has a pretty inspiring story. Anyway, I've asked Sue Erlewine uh, to read the root texts for us. And so uh, Sue, take it over. Okay, so this is from uh, The Great Path. Uh, the Mahayana instructions for how to die are the five forces. Posture is important. When a person who is trained in this teaching is stricken by terminal illness, he or she should practice the five forces. First, the force of virtuous seeds means giving away all possessions without a trace of attachment, without clinging or concern. In general, they can be given to one's gurus or to the jewels. In particular, they can be given to whatever person thinks they will, they will be more, most helpful. The force of aspiration means to make enlightenment the single focus of aspiration by practicing the seven branch prayer if possible, or if not possible by praying through the power of whatever virtuous seeds I've gathered in the three times, may I never forget, but train and strengthen precious bodhicitta in all future experiences and existence. May I meet the pure gurus who reveal this teaching. I pray that these aspirations be realized through the blessing of my gurus and the jewels. The force of repudiation is to think, this ego cherishing has led me to suffer for countless existences, and now I experience the suffering of dying. Ultimately, there's nothing that dies, since neither self nor mind have true existence. I'll do whatever I must to destroy you, ego, cling ego clinging, who constantly think in terms of, I'm ill, I'm dying. The force of impetus is to think, I will never be without the two kinds of precious bodhicitta, not at death, nor in the intermediate state, not in any future existence. The force of familiarization is to bring clearly to mind the two bodhicittas that have been practiced previously. While the main point is to practice these forces single-mindedly, the accompanying actions are also important. Physically, one should sit in the seven-point posture, or if unable to do that, Lie down on the right side and rest the cheek on the right hand while blocking the right nostril with the little finger. While breathing through the left nostril, one should begin by meditating on love and compassion and then train and sending and taking in conjunction with the coming and going of the breath. Then without clinging mentally to anything, one should rest evenly in a state of knowing that birth and death, samsara and nirvana and so on are all projections of the mind and that the mind itself does not exist as anything. In this state, one should continue to breathe as well as one can. There are many highly regarded instructions on how to die, but none, it is said, is more wonderful than this one. An instruction for death that employs a salve states, apply to the crown of the head an ointment compounded of wild honey ash from burning unspoiled seashells and filings from an iron magnet. So. Thank you, Sue. Thank you very much. So this workshop will um, try to unpack all the instructions that are involved uh, in that uh, text. So uh, the, 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 the five powers or the five forces that are outlined here are, first of all, virtuous seeds. We'll talk about that. Our aspiration, repudiation, the force of impetus, and finally, the force of familiarization. Briefly, before we go into each one of these, let's just give a little bit of a definition. Virtuous seeds means uh, we give away our possessions. 
at, uh, when we are contemplating and close to dying, we should have given, at least in spirit, all of our possessions. And the, the author is very clear here, without a trace of attachment. And if we do that, that will assist our death and our dying and will uh, have good uh, results for the future life. Basically, we're planting this virtuous seed of giving everything away and that will bear fruit in this life, but in particularly in the next life. Then we make an aspiration. That aspiration is that my destination, my ultimate destination is full enlightenment. Aspiration is sort of like a rope that we climb up on that pulls us out of um, samsara. So we make an aspiration. The next thing we do is we repudiate. That's a really strong word, repudiate. I like it's, it's, it rolls off my tongue really nice. I like that word, repudiate. It basically means to publicly denounce something that has been privileged. And uh, we have to say that <laughs> when we look at our own ego, we privilege that throughout our lives. And so part of this is to repudiate that ego clinging. The next power we have, and we have these powers, it's not like something we have to, uh, that's uh, alien to us. They are within us. We have to cultivate them, but they are already in, in us. So we cultivate this power or this force of impetus. <clears throat> the two bodhicittas in this uh, statement is our unfailing guides that will propel us on our, and I'm going to use this word frequent, these, this phrase frequently throughout this workshop. It's going to propel us forward on our mind's journey. Bodhicitta, chitta means mind, bodhi means enlightened. And there are two aspects of that that we will consider today. The relative bodhicitta is basically a loving, kind, compassionate heart. We develop that. Ultimate bodhicitta is basically this idea that we're not going to um, be captured by appearances. We're not going to be seduced by them, thinking that they're somehow real, solid, and substantial. We don't get seduced by that. And that's through working with our uh, with ultimate bodhicitta. These two together, then, are our constant companions uh, through our journey. Then we have the power of familiarization, which means uh, that at death, if we're really practiced in love and compassion and used to the idea that um, these appearances are all dreamlike in nature. If we have those, if we practice that in our life, um, these practices then become second nature to us. And sort of at the point of dying, we can sort of reflexively practice them uh, as we go through this process. And therefore they are our best friends. This whole teaching is very practical. It's not uh, some philosophical treatise. It's very practical. We're being told uh, what to do in very practical terms. How, first of all, to deal with our stuff. How to deal with our feelings. How to deal with our uh, connections at the time of death. So, in this workshop, we're going to focus on the practical application of these instructions. So again, uh, there will be, I'm sure at some later date, a teaching on the Bardo, uh, but we're not going to focus on that today. The, the whole thing of death and dying were big issues with the, the Buddha. 
uh, when he left the palace and uh, met with various teachers, he always asked them, uh, the, his teachers, will this meditation, will this uh, practice help me to transcend uh, this unending cycle of suffering? And each of his teachers said no that the particular meditation that I have will not help you to transcend this cyclical um, suffering that we all have. Birth, death, rebirth, over and over again. This cycle that seems endless. It certainly has been beginningless, but the Buddha wanted to end it, and he could not, from his teachers, find it. So he searched out on his own to find a way to transcend uh, birth and rebirth. So the question comes, what is death? And you and I know that as we age, this uh, body-mind starts to fall apart. Um, and we could we could describe it in very uh, clinical, um, physical terms. We're not going to discuss that uh, in this uh, in this class. Uh, that's that would be for some other time. What we're interested in is really the bigger picture. In this workshop, we're going to concentrate on this death as being the end of our story. Death is the end of our story. Let me say that again. Death is the end of our story. Our stories obviously began at birth. And then we became sort of self-aware characters in a story. A story that you told yourself and to anybody else that was listening but the story you told yourself about yourself. But you're going to die. And this story that you told will end. All your plans, all your projects, all your hopes, all your dreams, all that's going to end. I'm not here to tell my personal story, but I'm 74 years old. And I looked up the, uh, in an actuarial uh, form on the, the internet, what is the average life of a male in the United States at 79? <laughs> so uh, it's likely that uh, within the next five years that uh, I, will, I will be looking at the very close proximity to my own death. And at that time, the story that I have told myself about myself and about my world will be erased. It'll be gone. It will be no more. What goes into our next life can be, there's various terms for it, but for the purposes of this workshop, we'll call it our mind stream our basic consciousness. And on that consciousness are imprinted our karmic acts, our karmic imprints, they will go with us. But when we die, we leave behind our body, we leave behind our family, we leave behind our friends, we leave behind our loved objects, all of our possessions, we leave behind our story. We die. The story is over. So we might further ask the question, what is mind? That's a tricky subject, but we'll say this much about it. In meditation, if we look for the mind, we can't find it. If in shamatha, we then go into vipassana, and in this quiet state, try to look at, reflect upon what is mine. We can't find it. I spent uh, a whole week with Kempokad Terimpoche in a summer retreat 
along with many others, where we explored that very idea. What is mind? So we can't find it, but we know that it's not nothing. The Buddha's teaching on non-self is not nihilistically saying that self is nothing. It's not saying that. So also, we, if we look at karma, that can be very tricky. And it's a complicated topic. But karmic imprints are whatever is so deeply planted into your mind that they continue into the next life. So if you've cultivated a kind, loving, generous mind, that follows you into the next life. Good qualities that you've nurtured in, the, in this life will endure into the next life. So Buddhist teaching tells us that we really should be careful about what we're thinking and particularly our interactions with others. So we cultivate <clears throat> this basic goodness that becomes strongly ingrained into our mind stream on a deeper level. Through meditation, we develop a clarity and a connection. You might say a connection with the, with the sacred. This clarity and this connection with the sacred will be our very best friends in the next life. So these are the themes that we'll be looking at during this workshop. So just a little bit, a very little bit about the bardo. So again, I remind you, we're going to die. We have no choice about that. All that is familiar to us will end, and we go into a space called the bardo, an in-between space between uh, life and rebirth. That's we call that the bardo. We can see it in linear terms as, as a progression uh, in time, but also we can see it as an opportunity of our unenlightened self to become enlightened. So we can see it, if, if you want to, uh, in terms of a vertical line from an unenlightened state to an enlightened state. So it can be viewed that way. And there are times in that period of time where we can, um, we can have opportunities to awaken. <clears throat> in fact, <clears throat> we can awaken at any point during that period of time. That's the good news. <laughs> the difficult news is we can only awaken in the bardo if we practice really, really well. We have strong devotion to our gurus. Um, and if we have those things, well then, um, it's possible to go from this confused, bewildered state to a state of, of enlightenment. So we're going to die. We get wake up calls all the time. Most of the time we ignore them. To say nothing about getting prepared as a result of them, we ignore them. Oh, thank God, it's over. <laughs> you know, uh, but we get these, we get these uh, wake up calls. So what we're going to do in this workshop is to sensibly react to these wake-up calls. We're going to try to do a little preparation so that when that time comes, we're going to be prepared. So you might say this workshop is a sensible rehearsal and preparation for dying. Hopefully, uh, subsequent to this workshop, you'll develop your plan uh, for your destination, your plan for this journey of the mind. You know, 
uh, we plan all the time for vacations. We plan for uh, friends to come visit us. We, we plan our mornings. We do all kinds of planning. So it's only sensible, I think, that we do a little bit of planning for something that's going to affect all of us and profoundly affect all of us. There are two things that's going to mess up our journey. The first thing that can mess up our journey is we can't let go. Some of you work in hospice. I volunteer sometimes with hospice. And it is heartbreaking to see folks who at the very end are, ha are having extraordinary difficulties letting go. It's so tragic. It, it hurts our mind <clears throat> when we can't let go. And also it hurts those around us because they are suffering with us. They love us and they see us struggling to let go. That, that hurts their mind too. So the remedy is working on this whole process of letting go and not waiting until we're uh, on our deathbed, that's too late. But the suggestion here is work each day a little bit on letting go. And we'll talk about that as we go along. Of course, the reality is whether we uh, acknowledge this, whether we do let go or not, death is going to occur. So again, that can mess up our journey really badly. So we want to work on that. The second thing that's going to screw us up is we don't, we're not prepared. We just don't make the right preparations. And there are some simple, uncomplicated things we can do that will help us be prepared at the time of death. And we're going to talk about those in a minute. How many times have you heard people who um, are close to death say, I'm not prepared for this? So preparation is one thing that's really important and can screw up our, our journey. So today we'll use the great path of awakening to begin to let go and to prepare for our death. Today, we're going to imagine that we've been given a terminal diagnosis. The doctor said to us, uh, Tom, you have a year, six months, I can't really tell you exactly, but <clears throat> death is on your horizon. <clears throat> so I'm asking you, to put yourself in that position of being told by a doctor that you have six months to a year to live. Imagine that. We can't be sure exactly how long. You know, it's not an exact science, but we know it's going to happen. It's on the horizon. It's within our sights. So the first instruction of the text is plant virtuous seeds by giving away your stuff. The text says very directly and do it without a trace of attachment. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the tough part, to give it away without attachment. You know those antiques that your great-grandmother has that you really hold on to? Give it away without attachment. That beautiful car that you saved up for years so you could buy and have, give it away without attachment. That home you have that you spent years paying off the mortgage on, give it away without attachment. 
in Tibet, there's this um, tradition that you give a portion of your wealth uh, uh, for the rights around your uh, death. And then you give half, another third to the monastery. <clears throat> and the final third you, you give to uh, your inheritors. Um, you don't have to do that in this culture, but it's always good to think about um, giving charitably either to a religious or a charitable organization at this time. That, that's a nice idea. And it's a virtuous one. So because the doctor has told us we have this diagnosis and because we're going to die, and because we have possessions, we're going to sow the seeds, they're called positive seeds, and give away our stuff. There's a word in Sanskrit. I don't know Sanskrit, I just know this word in Sanskrit. This word in Sanskrit is dana, D-A-N-A. -A. Uh, and we get uh, our word donation from it. <clears throat> well, it doesn't mean bestow, bestowing anything. It actually means wiping away, clearing away. So when we're giving, when we're giving away our stuff, we're sweeping away our greed, we're sweeping away our attachments to our stuff. So part of the preparation for dying is, well, maybe making a will. Maybe some of you already have, and if you haven't, it's certainly a very positive thing to do. Figure out who you're gonna give what to, and do it in a way that's clear, so that people don't have to fight over it. It's a bad thing to do, to give stuff away, and then not be clear about it, and they fight about it. You don't want that to happen. So you're gonna be clear about it. And the other thing you, you can do is look at your stuff and see what nobody <laughs> maybe wants and clear that away. Um, I'll tell you a quick story about my mother. She was, uh, she's really, she knew she was uh, going to die. And so she had uh, two people, very good friends of hers come in and they, uh, she, she was also, a, not a hoarder, but you know, she kept a lot of junk around. And between the three of them, they sorted all that out and she gave much of it to them. And uh, so when, after her death, we went into her house and when we went into the basement where all of her clutter and junk and stuff were, we were so amazed and so happy that she got rid of all that junk so that we didn't have to worry about it. Now, I say it was junk, it was obviously things that were valuable and uh, uh, the, the people that were cleaning the house uh, could use. I'll give you another example of a person who's done, a, I think, doing a good job of um, giving away their stuff is Michael Erlewan. Uh, he uh, has all kinds of Dharma materials and stuff and he was very kindly, he's been thinking about this for a while. I think he's in his 80s or close to it. And so he's thinking about that, you know, the inevitability of his own death. So he gave uh, Columbus KTC all of his Dharma materials, which was a wonderful gift on his part. He planted a seed. He's not only doing something good for himself, but he obviously is doing something good for everybody else. So you might have some specific things that you want to give away. Um, uh, and uh, that's always a good thing. And as specific as you can be, I think the better. I will tell you another quick story. My great aunt, uh, when she died, she had a 480 acre farm in West Virginia. And her will, which was really a crude legal instrument, in her will, she said, I, he get, she gave to my father 75% of the farm and 25% to my uh, cousin. 
well, <laughs> try figuring out who gets what part of the, do, do I get the 25% down there by the swamp? <laughs> so um, many years later, uh, after much litigation, we got that all figured out. So to be specific is uh, a, a blessing to your inheritors. The important thing here is your attitude when you're doing this. If you say, you know, hey, just take this stuff. You've been waiting for it all. You've been waiting the sidelines all along just to get this stuff. Uh, take it. It's yours. You're going to screw it up anyway. I know how you're going to treat it. You're going to treat it bad. Blah, blah, blah. You know, if that's your attitude uh, in giving, that's, um, that's not going to be very helpful. You want to plant a positive seed. And part of planting a positive seed is your attitude. Just think of how happy you were receiving whatever it was, how happy you were of acquiring this house, how happy you were getting this car or this object, this loved object. Think of how happy you were then and translate that feeling into giving. I was happy getting it. Now I'm happy giving it. Experience that joy as you give your stuff away. And think I'm creating good karma for myself in this and in future lives. I'm planting a seed. This you know, may sound a little selfish, and it is, but it's a good selfish. It is an intelligent selfish to give away joyfully what you have because it's going to create good karma. And how can you help others in a, in a future life if you haven't created the karma to do that? So now here's your work. Here's what you have to do in this workshop. Consider you're going to die. Consider the fact you have six months to a year. Where do you want your stuff to go? Who do you want it to go to? Who gets what? And if, if you've already made out a will, think about that again. Is there things since I've made out my will I want to be more explicit about? It? So you're going to give away your stuff. Try to do your mindful best to do that. Obviously, in this short workshop, and within four or five minutes, you're not going to be able to do that completely. But I want you to begin that process here and now. Who gets what? I'm dying. I can't hold on to this stuff anymore. I can't take it with me. So let's spend oh, just three or four minutes contemplating giving away your stuff. Begin that process.
um, things or stuff that's going to be left behind. What you will take on this journey of the mind is the mind, nothing else. So we want that mind to be in good shape and not chained down by a bunch of stuff. And this generosity that you display by giving yourself away gives you freedom and it makes you a better person. There may be problems with this. You know, you may have relatives, friends come by and they, they learn what you're doing. And they say, well, you shouldn't have given that to this person. You should have given it to them. You should have given more to that person. You should have given more to charity. You know, they're going to second guess you. <clears throat> and you're going to start having doubts well, and, and get back into your relationship with the stuff. And what you're going to have to do at that time is say to them, I've done my best. It's not the best. I've done my best to distribute my stuff to people in a wise way. I've done my best. I can't do any more. And I'm done with stuff. I'm done with my relationship to stuff. I don't want to talk about it anymore. It's done. So let's just take a moment to talk to those who may make us doubt what we've done to be correct. It's the best we can do, tell them that. So let's just take a moment to tell folks we did the best we could, we're done with stuff. So uh, until we actually die, we can make this sort of a daily practice. Sort of uh, as you're going through your day, look at the grip attachment has, uh, the grip that the attachment you have to things, how that grips your mind. And look at, you know, how can I loosen that grip for the attachment? They're just things. Eventually, I'm going to have to give them up. That's a daily practice of letting go. Don't wait. Don't wait until the time of death. It's too late then. Because if you don't complete this process on your deathbed, you're going to feel uncomfortable about this unfinished business of getting rid of your attachment to stuff. You could sort of think, and this is, this is a way uh, it's explained in uh, many of the texts. Our minds at the time of death were sort of like an archer pulling back the string on the, on the bow and aiming the arrow. So as we pull back, that's the intensity. And our aim is our destination. If we don't pull back hard enough, if we don't have a strong enough motivation to reach our destination, if we don't have that motivation, then the arrow is going to drop on the ground. So the important thing is our aim. Our aim is to have a, a, a happy death, a peaceful death. And the strength of that depends upon the actions we take prior to that event. If our mind is filled with hate and with anger, that really messes things up. Now we have to understand something here. This whole workshop is based on the premise that we're going to have time at the time of death to uh, sort things out. 
well, there is such a thing as sudden death. You know, we could be in a car accident. We could be run over by a car. I mean, there's all kinds of possibilities here for a sudden death, which makes it even more important that we prepare now because we don't know what type of death we may experience. We're taking the fact that we're going to have time and, uh, you know, um, and that may be the ideal, but that may not be what happens to us. Again, that's more reason for us to develop a happy, healthy mind uh, around death. So just as we develop attachments around stuff, and this is the harder one, this is much harder, I think. We've also developed attachment to people, our loved ones. And this is the hardest part. We have to let go of those attachments. And that's hard. But we can also say there is sometimes a stickiness, a clinginess to our relationships that can get exaggerated during difficult times when we're troubled or we're being disabled. We can become, you know, highly dependent. Now, from a physical standpoint, sometimes we'll just have to be dependent upon others, you know, to, to feed us. Uh, to bathe us, to take care of us. That may be, you know, that may be a part of our death, our dying. But I'm not talking about that kind of dependence. I'm talking about the kind of clinginess that is unhealthy that we have in relationships. If we can become less attached less emotionally needy, but at the same time, more loving. This will benefit you and those around you, whether your death is six months from now or 60 years from now. If we become less attached, we are freer. We travel lighter on this mind journey. There is an old Tibetan uh, analogy that I think really fits this situation. It's about, we're all sort of like at a hotel, a hostel maybe, uh, uh, a convention. Um, we're all, all together at that, a lodge or an end. Uh, it's updated a bit. And we, we meet people there and we enjoy their company. And the perspective is, this is not forever. These relationships are not forever. But while we're there, we're going to enjoy each other's company. We treat each other politely. At the same time, there's this total absence of stickiness. We'll leave tomorrow or the next day. But everybody will be enriched by the encounter. So we can apply that kind of perspective to our relationships right now, particularly to our loved ones. And in that relationship, we don't expect anything. You have no expectations of what they do. You are there to be kind, to be loving, you are a kindness to others. Taking that perspective, we're rehearsing for our departure. So there's this story about a Tibetan farmer. He was known in the area for being uh, really kind and he had this famously uh, harmonious family. Everybody said, this, this guy's got, I mean, they get along so well, so beautifully. And uh, so one day the farmer's son was killed in a farming accident. 
And so all the village people came to pay their respects to the farmer and his family. And the farmer was just doing his routine. He was not involved in any particular kind of ritual, no, uh, no mourning. And that sort of astounded all the village people. They said, what the heck is this all about? We thought this was a harmonious family. When someone in the family dies, they would, they would be paralyzed. So they asked the farmer, said, farmer, why are you, how can you go about the routine of your life and, and, uh, and not be, you know, overwhelmed by your, your eldest son's death? And his reply was, when I get up in the morning, my wife and I remind each other and our children that we're fortunate to be alive. We respect each other. We try to bring out the best in each other. We avoid taking for granted each other. We respect each other's boundaries. He said, I love my son as only a father could love a son. But we have known all along that this was all impermanent. This is just the way things happen. And it was and it was and is our blessing to know that. So in that story, that was uh, supposed to be one of the Buddha's past lives. It was the Buddha who was the farmer. And of course, we're not the Buddha. We reside in a relative world. Uh, and we do have troubled neurotic minds. <laughs> Yet our death is approaching. And it makes sense to adopt this wider, deeper, wiser perspective. That's a good thing. Maybe we have some difficulties approaching that, but that's a wider, deeper, wiser perspective. I wake up. My gosh, I'm alive. What a blessing. And doing this day, I'm going to treat my family, my loved ones, anybody I encounter with kindness and love because tomorrow, so now we'll do another exercise. So again, to remind you, you're dying. And you need to go to your loved ones. And you can't wait until the moment of death to talk to them. I mean, we have this sort of Hollywood death scene scenario in our head that, you know, lights, soft candles, and everything. It's not, it's not likely to be like that. Great if it can be, but it's not likely. So now, as we know we are dying, that we have a diagnosis, we're going to go to those that we love. We're not going to wait to the last minute. We're not going to wait for some sort of glorious finale. We're going to have a difficult conversation with our loved ones. I can't tell you exactly what you need to say. You know what you need to say but I'll give you some words that might structure your conversation. And it might go something like this. Dear one, I know you know I'm dying. And I want to, go to, I want to do a good job of it. And you have to forgive me. I'm not like I was before. I'm not. I'm dying, so I'm not like I was. And I'm doing my best to prepare for dying. I know you love me, and I know you know I love you. And because of that, you know I wish you nothing but happiness. But right now, the best thing you can do for me 
is to allow me to go on my journey. Allow me to free my mind from this life because I have to do this. Pick out one or two loved ones that you want to have this conversation with and try to say what you think will be most helpful to both you and them. I'll give you, you know, four, three or four minutes to do this. So uh, this can be a difficult time in the process of our letting go. And so what we're going to do with this difficulty is bring it to Tong Lin. Uh, it's a way to add wisdom and compassion to our situation. It may take a little time to learn, but uh, we'll use the basic instructions that Kimpo Carter Rinpoche has given us. It's basically <clears throat> to use the breath in our meditation. We breathe in the suffering of beings in the form of dark smoke, and we breathe out our love, compassion, and wisdom. 
in the form of white light. And this will help us to deal with this suffering. So Tonglin is breathing in, taking on a difficult emotion and breathing out the wisdom that's in our heart. The point is that at any time we could be angry, we could be jealous, we could be sad, whatever. But whatever we feel at our deepest level, we have a goodness and a kindness, a wisdom and a compassion. And this all happens in our mind. So we breathe in suffering. As you do, make it real. Make it real. That's the power of this. Breathe in the pain. That takes a little bit of courage. By breathing in the pain, the suffering, we're facing it. We're dealing with it. We bring it into our bodies and we allow it to enter our heart. But Kempo Karta Rinpoche taught us that when it comes into our heart, uh, this suffering that we imagine dissipates like water on a piece of hot iron. It just goes, psh, fizzles and goes away. It doesn't survive. And it doesn't survive because of the heat and wisdom of our own heart, our own wise heart. So um, on the in-breath, we take in the suffering. And on the uh, exhale, we send out love and compassion. So um, we'll do a little Tong Lin, bringing in on our in-breath, the suffering and pain we have and leaving our stuff and our loved ones and breathing out our wisdom and compassion for ourselves. Um, I'll, I'll assist you in this meditation a bit. Uh, it'll be guided. So to begin this meditation, Visualize yourself in front. You've just spoken to your loved ones. They were difficult conversations. It wasn't the best, but you did your best to be clear and compassionate. In the aftermath of that conversation, you may feel some relief. But there is a remaining sadness, maybe an anxious emptiness, a feeling alone. Breathe that in. Feel that pain. Face it. Don't be afraid. Allow it to go into our wisdom heart. Allow it to dissipate like water on hot iron. Breathe out compassion and love to this person with suffering. Breathe out wisdom, the wisdom that knows impermanence. The wisdom that knows that all reality is illusion-like. Breathe in any feeling of loss. Breathe out the wisdom you have gained through Dharma practice or any spiritual practice that you may have at the moment.
Breathe in your suffering. Breathe out your love, compassion, and wisdom. Acknowledge your sorrow. Bring it closer to you. Without a recognition that all things are impermanent. Breathe in any feelings you may have of loss. Breathe out the wisdom that knows all things must end and we have to depart. We are players in a dream. Breathe in your fear and anxiety, your feelings of aloneness. Breathe out this surprising reservoir of courage and compassion you have that you've sown when you've had these difficult conversations. You had that courage and you have it now. So now in our visualization, let's include our relatives because they feel sad too. Include them, your loved ones. Include also all those who are facing death and having to tell their relatives and all those relatives who are having to face their loved ones' death. All of them are suffering. Bring that in into this beautiful heart of compassion and breathe out that love and compassion that is within your heart. You have this wise perspective. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So we're letting go here. We're getting our sights set on death and dying. We've gotten rid of all of our stuff, the stage props, you might say. Next, we allow the chief characters in our story to exit from the stage. The story you told about yourself is about to end. We may meet some of these characters that we have met in this life in future lives, but it's unlikely we're going to recognize them as the characters in this story in this life. We might meet up with them again. In fact, we probably will. But before we exit this story, we've got a few acknowledgements to make. This is sort of like when they run the credits at the end of a movie. We credit this person and that person and so forth. So before we end this story, we're going to do some credits. We're going to acknowledge who in our story helped us, and we're gonna thank them. 
we're going to recognize those that we helped and we're going to rejoice. We're going to look at those we've hurt and humbly ask for forgiveness. And those that we've hurt, or that have hurt us, excuse me, those that have hurt us, out of our compassionate heart, we're going to forget. So again, those who helped us, those we have helped, those who hurt us, and those we've hurt. Those are the main characters in our story. We have, it, it's good to acknowledge them before we exit to end our story. We're running the credits. We can't get everybody in right now. One of the practices you might want to consider is journaling, going back through the years, looking at the different characters that you helped, helped you, hurt you, and you hurt. Going back and doing this process, it can be very uh, spiritually helpful. But right now, we're just going to do a little of that. We're going to spend three or four minutes just, so let's just do the last year or so. Who's, who, who is in your, who are the main characters in the story right now? And uh, we'll acknowledge them. Let's take just a few minutes to do this. Who's helped me? Thank them. Who have I helped? Be grateful. Who's hurt me? I forgive him. Who have I hurt? Ask for forgiveness. So this journaling that we could do uh, might be helpful. I, I certainly highly recommend that you do something like that because uh, it, it helps you gain perspective. And the funny thing about it is, as you go back, um, you start remembering things that you long ago forgotten, people that you've helped, people that have hurt you and all those sort of, sort of things. Uh, and it can be very, uh, very helpful in our, um, summing up and running the credits of our lives. 
Um, it is 10.30. Uh, uh, thank you for all the work you've done so far. This is your workshop and the success depends upon your doing this work. So I, I am profoundly uh, grateful that you're, you're working with this. So let's take, um, let's take a potty break, a break to, uh, or tea break, whichever, or both. And uh, let's, let's give ourselves 10 minutes to do that. And so come back at, uh, let's come back at uh, 1040. Is that okay? Yeah, let's take a little break. Swamp in the morning. I get out in the, uh, so I'm in a swamp and I get out early in the morning. I take a shower, get cleaned up, get dressed. And say, you stayed in the swamp a little longer. And uh, when you came out, though, you got, because you liked it in the swamp, maybe. You're sort of a swamp person. But all of a sudden, then you realize, hey, I'm in a swamp. It's not so cool. So you get out, you dress, you get cleaned up. If I look at both of them, they're both clean. They're both out of the swamp. So one got out earlier, the other didn't. It doesn't matter. The fact is they both got out. So it doesn't matter really too much when you get this. If you get it, you got it. I was in a 10-day uh, teaching with Kempokata Rinpoche. And uh, I asked him, I said, and I, I was in the same boat. I was thinking about going into retreat after, you know, not 60 years old. And that's sort of like not heard of, but I did it anyway. But I asked him, I said, Rinpoche, is it too late? And his response was, it's never too late. But uh, his words were something to the effect, get your hind end in gear. <laughs> you, you need to start. Don't wait forever. So it's like that. It's never too late, but uh, we need to get started. I don't know that you heard uh, my request, but my request was uh, before I turned off my sound is that you have a pillow. If you, uh, if you have a pillow someplace uh, you can get, uh, we're going to use that later on before we end the talk. So I debated whether to have a question and answer and sort of get your general responses and reactions now or later. And uh, I decided if it's okay with you, we'll just plow on through. Is that all right with everybody? And then we'll, at the end, cool. At the end, we'll do some reflections because uh, I really, really am interested in in uh, your reactions and your reflections. Okay, so we'll begin. So uh, you and I have done some preparatory work in letting go, um, and that's good. Uh, now we go to the next force, is called repudiation. I've changed the, the order here uh, for a reason, but we're, we're going to take up the force of repudiation. It's one of the five forces that we talked about in the beginning. So <clears throat> here you and I are on this empty stage. All our props are gone, our furniture, our, all of our possessions. They're not a concern of us uh, for us anymore. All the characters are gone. Our loved ones, the people that populated our lives. And I'm now alone, you're alone, and I'm going to speak in the first person now. I'm all alone to deal with the last character in my story. And that's ego clinging. Ego clinging has had a star role in my story. Sadly, 
much of the drama in my life began and ended in ego clinging. It's hauled the stage to my embarrassment sometimes and to my remorse many times too. I've allowed it a privileged position in my life. As a result, much of my story has been about me elbowing to get my way to the center stage. Those that I've elbowed out of the way, I had, you know, I'll be honest with you, I had no regard for them. I was wanting that center stage. I didn't care about other people's happiness in that respect. I'm a central character, I want center stage. And to tell you the truth, most of my life has been about my ego being on center stage. But here I am, standing on an empty stage without an audience to play to. And being here, I see that this ego I clung to was truly the villain in my story. As I look at my death as imminent, as it comes closer to me, I have little appetite to continue this exhausting charade. So I lament with Shanti Deva when he said, the thought never ever came to my mind that I too am a brief and passing thing. And so through hatred, lust, and ignorance, I have been the cause of much distress to me and others. So here it is, here I am. All my possessions are gone. I've given them away. The characters in my story have exited the stage. And I look with sadness and remorse as to how I played my part. I elbowed my way to center stage when there were others that could have played the part much better. So I acknowledge with Zigar Rinpoche a positive remorse. Instead of wallowing in guilt and self-pity, I'm going to connect with an open-hearted tenderness of regret. This regret leads me to say never, never, never again will I allow this ego clinging to hurt me and others. Never again am I going to waste my time fighting for center stage. Never again am I going to try to forcibly impose my will on others. Never, never again is it going to be me, me, me. This false, hollow sense of self I called me has no reality and I have clung to it and held it most precious all my life. So having repudiated it, 
in future lives, I'm going to be a kind person. I'm going to be a loving person. I'm going to be pleasant to be with. I'm going to be a refuge for those that really need love. And we all need love. So let's do some time in here, all of us. Imagine ourselves in front of ourselves. See the me that has been so fixated on my story, my way, my will. How painful. How exhausting that role has been. Breathe that in, the pain of having to posture like that. Breathe it in. Let it hit that compassionate, loving heart. And let it hit like water on a hot iron. And breathe out, which comes from this heart of love and compassion. Breathe out your love and your understanding that person standing on the stage, empty, no one. Give them your love and your compassion. You did the best you could. It wasn't the best, but you did the best you could, despite your ignorance. It did the best you could. Give that person love and compassion. All these fixations you had to self, to others, to things, to stuff, breathe that in. And breathe out your understanding of the permanence, impermanence of things. Breathe in that shut down, closed off person you were clinging to people. Breathe it in. Because you recognize it. Don't run away. And breathe out your love and compassion. Open hearted love. And know that even though from beginningless time, this is how you operated, it doesn't have to be anymore like that. Breathe out your desire to put others before yourself. Breathe out the wish to be a nice person. Breathe out the wish that every solution you ever offer is graced with wisdom that knows the empty nature of all appearances. The wisdom that knows that 
this moment is brief. We are brief in passing things. So just a moment. Let's do this meditation. But let's not think that we're alone, really. All over the universe, there are folks standing on an empty stage preparing to die, looking at the shallowness of their ego clinging. You might be in a slightly better position because you know this and they might not, and so they will continue to suffer with this. So our love and compassion goes to, out to every person now standing on an empty stage, ready to die, and we give them our love and our compassion, bring in their suffering, and bring out and breathe out your love and compassion in brilliant white light. Again, thank you. So um, what we've experienced here is really the, the next force, the force of aspiration, the force that wants to drive us towards more enlightened behavior, ultimately to enlightenment. And that's a powerful tool we got. We used it in this Tang Lin exercise. The power, the force of aspiration. It's going to be the power and the force, however strong we have it, it's like aiming that bow and arrow. If it's a strong force, if we really wish to be a kind, loving person, in our next life, and we pull that bowstring back with force, and we've aimed it properly, that's going to wind us up in a far better position that we, than what we might have otherwise been. The force and the power of aspiration. The fifth power, excuse me, the fourth power, we did, the, we did the aspiration, now we're doing the power of impetus. Um, what do I want to say about that? Okay, the, what it says in that force of impetus is that we carry along throughout our lives, through uh, our future lives, the two bodhicittas. 
They are our friends, they are our companions. We should always travel with them. Uh, the two bodhicittas have been explained uh, in the path, the Great Path of Waking. Again, if I may uh, say to you, it's a really good book to get. Go over it with someone that has already gone over it. It's very difficult to do it by yourself. The first bodhicitta is exchanging our happiness for the difficulties of others, being kind and loving. This is our companion. This desire, this wish to benefit all beings. It will be an unfailing help as we go through our future lives. And particularly this next life. Impetus is aspiration is about future lives, future. Uh, aspiration to enlightenment. This impetus is more about the very next life, the, the bow that the arrow that propels us into the next life. This is about impetus. And so we use the two bodhicittas. And the other one that we don't speak a great deal about is ultimate bodhicitta, which is summed up in the instructions given in the great path as to regard all phenomena as dreams. That sort of encapsulates the idea of ultimate bodhicitta. So um, as we make this journey into this death and dying experience, we need these two, these two aspects of bodhicitta, loving heart, a kind heart, not an angry heart, but a loving heart. Almost every religion that I know of speaks of the absolute importance of our attitudes and our state of mind at the time of death. That this immediate state of mind is likely, particularly if it's strong anger or or that sort of thing, that will propel us into the next life and we will experience states similar to that mind state. So that if we're really angry, resentful, that sort of thing, we're, we're not, we will wind up in states of paranoia, of, you know, crazy angry and all that sort of thing. You know, uh, every religion has that. Um, coming from a Catholic background, I remember we pray to the Virgin Mary that now and at the hour of our death, uh, pray for us. Uh, so it's a, it's a prominent thing almost in every religion. So this, this fourth instruction is that at the time of death, keep in mind a kind, loving heart. Try to put yourself in that frame of mind, a kind, loving heart that is concerned not only about ourselves and our fate in this bother, but concerned for every being that will inevitably go through the same process. No one's escaping this. And we have to have this quiet, loving mind that can recognize the projections our mind will project in the bardo. That will help us if we know this is you know, all a projection of my mind. If I can understand that, that'll make the journey easier. In fact, it will be a successful journey. We have it on the words of our lineage masters. So the final 
one is the power of familiarization. I'm going to read that because that might be helpful to us. So it says the instructions are the, uh, I, <clears throat> the force of familiarization is to bring clearly to mind the two bodhicittas. So we've done that. Now we're going to do the one on, excuse me, on the one of uh, force of familiarization. And that is to bring clearly to mind the two bodhicittas that we have practiced previously. While the main point is to practice these forces single-mindedly, the accompanying actions are also important. So we're thinking about uh, you know, a kind heart and kind mind, and we're also thinking about you know, that, that, that this is the projections of a mind, these sort of things. So while it's important to have those thoughts, it's also important to follow these instructions. He said, physically, one should sit in the seven point posture. What Kimball Carter Rinpoche said was at the time of death, uh, we're probably not going to be able to sit in the seven point posture. <laughs> we're going to be too weak. So we follow the second instruction. I mean, if you can, uh, great. Uh, but most of us will not be able to do that. So we follow the second instructions. If unable to do that, lie down on the right side, rest the cheek on the right hand while blocking the right nostril with the little finger. While breathing through the less left nostril, one should begin by meditating on love and compassion and then train in sending and taking in conjunction with coming and going of the breath. Then, without clinging mentally to anything, one should rest evenly in the state of knowing that birth and death, samsara and nirvana and so on are all projections of the mind and that mind itself does not exist as anything. In this state, you should continue to breathe as well as you can. So uh, if you're able, some people may not be able to lie on the floor, but, it, uh, and so that's okay, just simulate you know, lying on the floor and, and, uh, and lying on your, on your side. But if you can do that, uh, I'd ask you to assume that position now which is, and I'll, I'll read the instructions, lie on your right side and rest the cheek on the right hand. While blocking the right nostril with your little finger. Again, if you cannot lie down, that's okay. No problem. Just simulate that you're doing it. So now you are close approaching your death. You've done the work. It hasn't been the best, but it's the best you can do. And that's something you should be at peace about. I did the best I could. I distributed my wealth. I let go of my relationships. I've repudiated my ego clean. And now I'm at the threshold of my departure. My story is ended. 
it's over. I did the best I could. All the suffering of this story I bring into my heart. All the joys of this life I bring into my heart. But particularly, I bring in all that suffering that I've caused myself and others. I bring it in. I breathe out. My love, my compassion, my wisdom to this person who enters the threshold of their death. Breathe in all the faults and mistakes. I recognize them. I take them on I, and I place them in my compassionate heart. And they evaporate like water on hot iron. And to this person, my love, my compassion, and most of all, I give my wisdom. If this has all been a dream, it has been a play of my mind. Birth, death, samsara, nirvana are all projections in my mind. And mind itself, mind itself does not exist as anything. You're not alone. There are literally millions in this and other universes that are here at the threshold of death. No, they are just like you, suffering. Have suffering. Breathe in that suffering. Breathe out to them with tender love and compassion and wisdom. Thank you. Thank you very much.
So um, this was where I was going to present some information about the Bardo. Um, but I, what I'm going to do is I'll give you a little, what you might say, a teaser <laughs> about the Bardo instructions. Um, and I'm not going to take uh, the major work that uh, Rinpoche did. I'm going to, uh, there's a little brochure, you can buy it at uh, KTD, and it's sort of uh, a preview uh, and a uh, sort of a mini instruction on the Bardo. Uh, and I'm going to read what he said uh, towards the, it was a talk he gave, I think it was at Michael Erlewine's uh, center, I'm not sure, but he said, let me see if I can find it. Ultimately, the experience of dying and death can be terrifying or it can be completely free of fear. This is Rinpoche talking 40 years ago. The choice is pretty much up to you based on the quality of your present life and the strength of your belief. If you have not generated virtuous actions of body, speech, and mind, and have no reverence for life or any desire to cultivate a healthy mind, <laughs> then you'll not be prepared. Any journey undertaken when we are completely unprepared will be a journey full of discomfort, apprehension, and fear. The experience of death and dying is just like that, only more serious. So uh, we come to the threshold and uh, Bardo teachings, maybe at some future date if you're interested. Uh, but this is the best preparation that uh, you can have for whatever comes up next in the Bardo. Um, there are many teachings uh, on um, death and dying in the Bardo, um, but this is certainly superior uh, in, in all the Mahayana teachings. And so I, I feel it's been a great privilege on my part to, to be able to, in some way, convey the profound teaching that we find in the uh, Great Path of Awakening. So um, I'm very grateful that I, I was able to be your teacher. Of course, teaching is a interdependent uh, uh, activity. For me to be a teacher, you have to be a student. And uh, from what I can uh, observe, uh, you were taking this very seriously and allowing me to be a teacher. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. So uh, why don't we open it up uh, to reflections, thoughts, questions? Lama Kathy, you there? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I, I wanna make sure that uh, when difficult questions come up, I'll have backup. <laughs> I'm, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. <laughs> Good. Carry Thank on, you. carry on. <laughs> so um, as long as you want to go, it's 11.20. We are scheduled to 12 o'clock, but that's up to you. Um, I would really be interested in your reflections and your thoughts. Um, Tanya, why don't you just unmute everybody? And uh, and we'll get reactions that way. Uh, Lama Tom, I think we might get a lot of background noise because there's so oh, many yeah. people. But everybody can unmute themselves when they when they'd like to speak. Yeah. Is that just, okay? Uh, yeah. Cool. So okay. just <laughs> unmute yourself and uh, your reflections. Don't be shy. Hi, Lama Tom. It's Kyla. Hi, Kyla. Hi. Um, one thing I was 
thinking is in my yoga training, we talked about left nostril breathing stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system, which I thought was really interesting. This was part of this practice. Um, and one thing that is helpful to know as well is that it can be done energetically, or you can visualize it if you can't physically, you know, breathe through your left nostril, um, or if your sinuses are clogged or something like that, just visualizing it will also calm your heart rate, lower blood pressure and bring relaxation. So I thought that was really cool. Oh, well, thank you. I'm glad you, you brought that, uh piece of instruction up that the visualizing can have the same bodily effect. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, very yes. interesting. The, this practice of uh, lying on your side and, and uh, blocking the nostril is an excellent nightly practice. Uh, I've been doing it lately and it's really cool. Sort of puts you, uh, puts you in the state of mind that eventually this is how it's gonna be. It's just a nice reminder. So I would encourage you, um, I don't know, it has to be a daily practice, uh, but it can be a really cool practice. But uh, thank you, Kyla, for, um, for uh, telling us about that. Yeah, I, I had a question. Um, so kind of going on what Kyla said, so what if, um, you know, in, the, in this world of people being intubated and sedated, so how can one be helped um, at that time? I mean, if you can't turn, you can't breathe, yeah. and you can't well, visualize. Are they, are they conscious or unconscious? Yeah, yeah, how do you, how can that, how can a Buddhist or someone who wants to practice this, but yeah. they, can't, they can't do it, so how because, do we? Because they're sedated and right. not conscious. Right, and maybe intubated, so they also can't do the breathing. Oh, yeah. So, so uh, if they are unconscious because of sedation, um, I have to say, I don't know that there's an answer to that. And the reason mm -hmm. I don't know that there's an answer to that is there was no such situations like that at the time of the Buddha. They did not have uh, medications uh, such as, you know, that put you unconscious. Uh, so I don't know that... Uh, you know, we can provide an authoritative answer. But in that situation, I will jump in <laughs> and, uh, and uh, say what I think. And this is clearly what I think. So I don't know. So what I think is um, uh, to the extent we can, if we know that's going to happen to us, then, um, what it, our state of mind at that point becomes very important. And we, we should, we should um, if we're with that person at that point, prior to incubation, prior to um, going into that uh, medicated state, that's the time they could do their preparation. Um, but we don't know what goes on in the mind of someone um, in that situation. And I think as far as you are concerned as a practitioner, uh, there are things that you can do, pray for them, uh, visualize, uh, rub their, the top of their head, if they're dying, you know, rub the top of their head um, and, and so forth. But just uh, praying Omani Peme Hong and wishing them well and, uh, those kind of things. I guess what you would do is whatever practice you perform as a, a practitioner, that might be a good time to do it. Okay. Thank you. Lama Kathy, uh, what, what's your thoughts on that? I think she may have stepped away, Lama Tom, but we do have a hand up from Monk Yamso. Very okay. good. Oh, Thank she's you. back. Yeah, yeah, I, I was trying to unmute, but it looked like it was just not working anyway. Um, so thanks. Um, thanks for the, uh, for the um, spiral bound death dying in the intermediate state by Venerable Kemble Carthur and Bache. Thanks for posting that. Yay. Uh, I appreciate that. That's very helpful. Um, I think that all of the things that we've talked about so far sound just right to me. It, it sounds just right. 
the idea of being able to do what we can, when we can, as we can. And I think that when we have so much advancement in medical science, and, uh, and there's a lot that is still unknown. And we need great masters like Kempo Kartharovice to help us to see what is the state of mind of a person at the varying points in complex medical care. And since we don't have him right now on hand to, to give us that kind of insight into the state of mind of a person undergoing intensive medical care, it seems to me that the, the best way to approach it is to continuously prepare our minds so that when we get there, so when, wherever we are, whenever we are, we are thinking about what we can do to look after ourselves and what we can do to bring about a stable, a stable and present uh, state of mind. Because I think that's really what it comes down to. It's like what Lama Tom was saying at the beginning of the program, our mind is what we take with us everywhere. So if we want to prepare ourselves, then it's really, really good to train now in shamatha, in, um, which is basic quiet sitting meditation, in uh, visualization, in mantra, in devotion, uh, doing all those kinds of practices now so that when the time comes that we need them, they're there for us. So I'm so sorry, I'm like Lama Tom, I don't know the answer to your question, but, um, but there's a lot that we can say around the question that might help us constructively work with our concern, which is we wanna be ready. So if we want, so if the real concern is we wanna be ready, then, uh, then I think anything we can do to, improve our love, compassion, uh, meditation, and so on. It's all going to be to the good. So wish I could answer the question. Hopefully in the future, we'll have some of the great masters who have examined these states and can talk to us more. But until then, I think we can support each other with advice like Rinpoche's, um, like the handout that we've got here on online. Thank you. Thanks, Lama. <laughs> Lama Tom, we have two hands raised by audience members. Uh, first is Monk Gyamso, and second is Bernard. Okay. Hello, Lama Tom. Um, as far as what was just being discussed, I was a respiratory therapist, and for two years I did terminal weans. This is end of life, removing the vent from people and allowing them to die. Uh, I set up a palliative care room for these people. I researched with their family, found their favorite movies, their favorite uh, soundtracks music, things that, uh, photos of their life. And we had the surrounding the person as we slowly turned down the vent. Um, when we started the soundtracks, uh, the person, uh, they didn't buck the vent as much. You could tell by their oxygenation. They could hear through the sedation that they were being cared for. So they can't be reached even when on a vent. Um, and now for my question, um, Coming up on 35 years this May, I was given a death sentence of three years. Uh, I did pass that by quite a few, um, but I, I became rather hedonistic and nihilistic for that, for that three years because I figured nothing mattered. I was gonna die, why care about anything? When I realized I wasn't dying right away, I changed my mind. <laughs> now, I've already had these discussions. I had the discussions with my family, with my friends, all in telling them where I wanted everything to go. You know, I said my goodbyes to everyone. My family I explained everything years ago. What's a good daily practice for those of us who've already dealt with this, who already had the mindset that I know I'm on borrowed time. So, you know, I know that every day I wake up already is a gift. You know, I consider being handed a diagnosis of death as a gift. Yeah. So a good daily practice for us, please. I'm sorry. A good daily practice, a, a reminder for those of us who've already been through this, um, just, uh, or those of us who have not. Um, yeah. 
Uh, uh, just a, a brief you. way of recognizing our own mental, our own mortality, and being grateful for it every morning. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. A really good question. I think it depends on the individual as to what um, what is helpful to them. Uh, for me, there's two practices I like. And uh, again, Lamek, first of all, I would say whatever your practice is right now, whatever it is, whether it's deity practice, maha mudra, mantra, whatever it is, that's the best practice for you right now to prepare you. That's the first thing. Additionally, um, what I like to do is every once in a while to sort of get a hold of uh, this feeling I have of attachment for stuff. Uh, we were going to the uh, to the exposition. What is that? The the, the ones that they project uh, artists. The artists, not Gauguin. What is it? There's a Van Gogh exhibition like Van that. Van Gogh. Yes. Yeah. So so <laughs> so yesterday or day before yesterday, we were going up to uh, Columbus for the uh, Van Gogh uh, thing, and. Uh, so we got stuck in traffic and uh, we were two hours late. And boy, <laughs> I'm gonna, you know, I, I'm really attached to the fact that I wanna get there and I gotta get there now. And, and of course we didn't. And all of a sudden I recognized this sort of grab that I had, that I had to get there. And I said, oh, you know, <laughs> doesn't really yeah, I mean so it was like recognizing and letting go there are innumerable opportunities every day to let go <laughs> and so we look for those and you know yesterday or day before yesterday I let go I just said okay <laughs> sat in traffic actually my wife congratulated me. She said, usually you just really get out of sort about this kind of stuff. And there you are being quiet. Okay, so I lost all the merit by telling you this and bragging about it. Sorry, but, but if it helps, you know. So I guess what going back to what you said, uh, your question is, your practice is a preparation. Your, your daily opportunities to let go of this ego. So I have to be someplace. I'm important. I got to get there now. And if I'm not there, the, the world caves in. That kind of thing is a preparation. Um, as Lama Kathy said, truly cultivating mindfully the fact that I'm going to be kind to that, that uh, person that's not being kind to me. That's a preparation. That's developing this heart of love and compassion. That's uh, a practice. That very special practice that we talked, that we did at the very end, it doesn't take much to do that. Laying on your side, putting your, uh, your finger to your nostril. That's a wonderful reminder that this is all gonna end and I better be prepared. So um, those are my thoughts on it. Mama Kathy, uh, what's your thoughts? I'm going to try to unmute. Did it work this time? You got it. Eee! Okay. Um, I think, um, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, uh, Monk uh, Jamso for uh, telling us his own story. That's an amazing yeah. story. Thank you for sharing. And also, thanks for sharing your, uh, your experience as um, a respiratory therapist. Um, I, I don't, I remember from when my dad passed away, um, uh, there was this sense that he could hear us no matter what. So, um, so I appreciate the idea of being able to be uh, verbally or vocally or musically present for someone uh, and to let them know your presence um, through hearing. And in a way, um, the, one of the names of the, um, of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the real name of it is uh, the um, Book of Liberation Through Hearing in the Bardo. So that's kind of a cool thing to note. 
But anyway, uh, going on to the question of what daily practice to do, I think everything that's the, everything Lama Tom's talked about, it, this is all this is all workable. Just you know, make something um, uh, something that is doable for us. Just pick something that's doable. But I will share one story that I heard. Um, I saw His Holiness the Dalai Lama interviewed on television once, and they asked him, "Well, how do you start your day?" And he said, "Well, I, I set my motivation." when I first wake up in the morning, I think, well, wow, I didn't die. Okay, so uh, so I'm going to try to make use of this day uh, to the best of my ability. And I remember Lama Tashi Dundup when he was teaching uh, the first retreat group at Karme Ling, the three-year retreat center of Kempo Kartharibache. He would often say that. He said, hey, guess what? We didn't die, yay. Now we can do some Dharma today. So I'm thinking that that's a two for one wake up, gratitude, not dead, yay, and I'm going to do some dharma today. So I'm th to me, that sounds kind of nice. So um, even though it's not like a formal practice thing, I think just hearing His Holiness the Dalai Lama talk about his own routine that way was really kind of inspiring. So thanks. Next up is Bernard, and then after Bernard, Judy, Christine, and Star. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, this is all really, really interesting and helpful. I have a question about the um, stage where we're looking, as you said, at ourselves with sadness and remorse. And you talked about positive remorse, uh, meaning to connect with uh, open hearted tenderness of regret about how ego clinging uh, we we were. Um, I have a question about the the regret part of it because my understanding so far has always been that regret itself is a form of clinging where we don't want to let go of the past. And uh, so I would like to know um, a little bit more about that, if you can talk just more about that and, and maybe the, about the directionality, so to speak, of this regret um, because of how it is also connected to, to clinging and, and not letting go. Yeah, so um, I'm going to make a distinction between regret and guilt. And if at those times that I'm recalling past faults, if I sort of stay in that state of, I'm still that person. I'm a horrible person. I've done something terrible. I'm not, that's guilt. It has absolutely in my mind, no value to, to simply wallow in that feeling I did something wrong and staying there. At least the way I see it, Bernard, the way I see it is regret is saying that's what I was. I'm not that person now. That person that did all that stuff they shouldn't have done or wished they hadn't have done, that's then. I'm sorry about that but that's not me now. And that sort of regret propels us forward. It gives us, guilt de-energizes us. We just feel like, you know, it, we, we wallow in our, and that to me is certainly a form of self cleaning Regret to me is, is saying, that's who I was, but this is where I'm going. This is who I will be. So um, I don't know if that answers your question or not. Does that help? It, it does. Um, I, I may contribute a little story, an experience I had uh, 16 years ago. I, Please, I, yeah. I was very sick. I had uh, cancer and I got chemo and I got really sick from the chemo had the pneumonia and was like 10 days in the ICU and I had a near death experience. And as I was lying there and um, really in this, in, this, um, in this process of dying, 
one of the things that happened was that I, I went through a couple of different stages, so to speak. And, and at one point, pretty much at the point where I thought I'm, I'm dying now, um, I felt this incredible regret and I, I've never had any other word for that, but it was actually not so much regret about myself, but it was regret about the people that I would leave behind my family, my friends. And, um, it was a very deep and hard to explain experience. Um, and I feel it co is connected to this, what, or to what you explained about, um, the regret about your own clinging, because I, I wasn't this, it's hard to explain. It felt like I was having this regret about who I was letting behind or leaving behind, but I was also it also felt through that, that I was letting go, that I was ready to die. And it, what you explained is actually helping me a lot to make sense of that experience, because as of now, I always had a hard time to really make sense of it because it felt like, as I said, regret as clinging or as attachment. But at the same time, I felt it wasn't really that. So right. I don't know if this makes any sense, but for me, it does make sense. Oh, I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, actually, Lama Kathy and I were talking yesterday, I think it was yesterday, about we can, we can actually enter the dying process uh, to a point. Uh, I won't go into the technical details, it's not important. But in the, uh, when we enter the bardock of uh, death and dying, we can enter that, but we can come back out of it at, uh, to a certain point. After a point, we're dead, but but we can enter it and come back out. I am not, uh, you know, I'm not qualified to say what you uh, entered was that state, but it does sound like that to me, and it makes all kinds of sense. So. Uh, Thank you for sharing that. And I think uh, if these teachings help to validate that experience, uh, cool, cool beans, as Lama Kathy says. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, too. Yeah, Lama Kathy, uh, what are your comments on that? And if you, if you don't, that's fine, too. Hello. She might not be there right now. We'll 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 catch up with her later then. Next up is Judy. Okay, Judy. Yes, hi. Um, first, I Hello. want to. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first, I want to thank you, um, Lama Tom, for this rich and very important workshop for for all of us. And also Tanya for posting those sites where we can get further information as a resource. So thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I have been in hospice work for quite some time and I, I'd like to share something with the group that I've found to be helpful. It's more on the practical side. Please. Okay, like advanced directives, which is also called power of attorneys. And it's a piece of paper that's a financial uh, power of attorney in which you designate a person that would take care of your finances when you're no longer able to. And then there's also the medical power of attorney that when you are unable to make medical decisions, then you designate someone who will step in and make those decisions. And then the medical field, of course, with, with that, will respect that and, and that person will make decisions that you're not able to make. Now, in, I'm in Iowa, so I, I know here, I can go to the computer and type in um, medical power of attorney, Iowa. And there's a form that I can print out as well as with financial. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. I'm not saying not to get an attorney, but I'm saying 
it's possible that you don't need an attorney. And um, I, I, you know, have helped patients, family members for the end of life, just do it um, with guidance, um, with my guidance. But it can be simple. And so that would be a suggestion as well, just to kind of take a look at that. Usually there are directions and how to fill it out. You need witnesses or a note or a notary. But anyway, I just wanted to pass that along because we don't know if something's going to happen all of a sudden, then who's going to make these decisions for us? Yes. Thank you. Anyway. Thank you so much, uh, Judy. You. Um, I think uh, those kinds of uh, instruments, legal instruments, you can get at the uh, uh, social work department of almost any hospital. But um, Sue, do you might be able to respond to this? Or is there some site like that you can go on on the internet? Yeah, I think there are a lot of sites. I think you just do a Google search. I don't know of anyone in particular, um, okay. but there are many sites that you can go to. Just type in, you know, advanced directives form. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of hospital sites have those. Um, yeah. So it's, it's pretty common. And, and yeah, you don't really need a lawyer. You just need some witnesses and they can be anyone. Um, I've done that at the hospital too. So yeah, it's a pretty accessible form these days. And it's a really important thing to consider. Um, you don't want your relatives at the hospital having to argue over <laughs> what to do with your care. It's My wife was a hospital social worker for I think about 30 years, I'm not sure how many years, but a, a number of years. And she said the worst battles occur among family members discussing the medical care at end of life. It just can be a horrible situation. So spare your family that burden and take care of that now. So Judy, you, met, you mentioned a very important part of uh, uh, our considerations for end of life. Thank you. The other important thing is to update them. <laughs> you know, if you did if you did these documents, you know, ten years ago, you might have changed. So make sure you do update them too. Thank you. I'll just this is Tanya, your Zoom host. I'll just quickly point out that Lama Kathy just po posted a spiritual advance directive form that people can use. Wonderful. And also, um, I teach legal writing at, in a law school. Just be careful with forms, and I. I I think the ones provided by hospitals and legal aid offices are probably going to be more reliable. Watch out for like the random legal forum sites on the internet because they can be they can be okay, but you have to be careful with those. So anyway, just putting that out there. Next up is Christine. Hello, Christine. Uh, hi, Lama Tom. Thank you so much. This is an incredible workshop. I appreciate it very much. Um, I'll try to be brief, but I, I want to talk about two experiences that I had. Fortunately, I was able to be with a Buddhist practitioner friend who was dying. I think it was in June, and he had been a student of Kempo Carter Rinpoche many years ago. Uh, I don't know if it's appropriate to say his name, but Lama Kathy might know him or some of the other longtime students. But when he was dying, I only had met him a few years ago, so I never knew him back then. But I met him about three years ago. And once we both knew that we were connected with KTD and, you know, that we were Buddhists, he remembered me. And he called me and asked if I could round up a couple, of, that's the way he put it, round up a couple of lamas to come and be with him. And so I did that. And I, and I also was there at the time uh, that they attended to him. I believe they probably did Amitabha and some other many, many prayers. And it was a beautiful experience. He participated in his own death. He was well aware of what was happening. Uh, he seemed to be really calm and really uh, just, he, he, what he needed was to have, the, he had needed the lamas and he knew to ask for that. So, it was really an unforgettable experience. It taught me a lot and it kind of changed my life and my own um, process about thinking, how, how will I do this if I ever have the opportunity to know when I'm dying? 
And then the other thing I wanted to say is that last spring, I actually had, I was in the position of needing an emergency surgery due to a complication from something that was supposed to be routine. And because of the complication, I ended up that I needed an emergency surgery at 2 a.m. at Albany Medical Center. And I know that I stayed really calm. I was thinking of Tara. I was thinking of Chenrezi. I was thinking about my teacher and my daughter. Uh, not necessarily in that order, I will admit. I thought a lot about my daughter and how she would get this phone call the following morning. But I stayed really calm. And the next day, the surgeon said to me, um, you were amazingly calm. You, you didn't panic. And I thought, you know, this is because of my practice. I knew that I might actually not. I thought, well, maybe this is it. And it was rather unexpected. And it, there was no time to prepare or call llamas or do anything. It was just like, OK, this might happen now. And I said, OK, wheel me in there. Let's go. <laughs> and I did wake up the next morning. And I felt like it was, it was, I think in the beginning of this class, someone or you might have, Lama Tom, you might have said, uh, well, now I can't remember what I'm trying to remember that you said, but <laughs> it's just that the moment might happen, you know, without the opportunity to do all of this prep work. And, uh, you know, any one of us could walk out the door and get in our car today. And then that's maybe something could happen. We, we don't know that we'll have years or months or even days to prepare. Uh, and naturally, I'm also in the age group where the time ahead of me is shorter than the time behind me. That's obvious. So I just, I really appreciate it. And I, and I do give a lot of thought to this now since the experience of watching this other Buddhist practitioner dying and since my own experience in the hospital last spring. So thank you, thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you, uh, Christine. A couple things you, you bring to my mind, which is our death can be exemplary. We can set the example for our loved ones. It can be very important. So this fellow obviously impressed you and mm -hmm. that example inspires you. And so that's an important lesson. The other thing, Christine, I want to thank you for is uh, being able to get those llamas there to him. It, like you said, it meant a lot to him. Mm -hmm. And so the gift you gave him, uh, my goodness, uh, is immeasurable. So yeah, you, you know, it meant it meant everything to him. That was really sure. what he, he sure. was really his kind of his dying wish. And they, they came immediately. There was no yeah. prop, no hesitation. They were just like, where is he and how soon can we get there? So it was an incredible experience. I was fortunate enough to, to be able to witness. So thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. So everyone is different, but if I were to meet with that unfortunate circumstance that something sort of happened like this, I hope, <laughs> I hope I have the mindfulness to see my guru above my head, that he's going to accompany me, that uh, Kimbo Kaito Rinpoche is right there with me the whole time. Um, and if I can do that in that moment that uh, may be very fleeting, uh, that's, uh, that would be my, my prayer, my hope. So, uh, but thank you so much, Christine. It's, it's a beautiful story. Um, Next up is Star. Star, yeah. Hello there. You have to unmute. There you go. She, uh, Star needs to be unmuted. Uh, everybody has the power to unmute themselves. So just do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's in the chat. Got it. Sorry. I, I didn't know I could le read lips, but I can. <laughs> uh, what can we, <laughs> what can we do to help others to prepare for death, who don't necessarily believe in the teachings of the Dharma? Yeah. So I think 
That's a really good question, Star. Uh, are you saying uh, someone who is dying? Is that, or is it just people in general? Oh, your grandma. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, who has no belief? I, I think we've talked about this situation before, and it's been a troubled relationship that you've had, uh, if I remember correctly, something that's difficult for you. And uh, I, I, first of all, we, we never want to impose our um, rights or religion on another individual who is not interested. That's, uh, that's a perversion of our own belief to try to impose that. I think the most important thing if this person is ill or, or uh, we're, we're we're having difficulty with them. To the extent we can, show them love and kindness, no matter what they throw at you. Show them love and compassion, not like we said earlier in the talk, not expecting them to respond positively or whatever, just showing kindness and love no matter what. The, that becomes complicated when people have not shown us kindness. But our bodhisattva vow, our vow is, it doesn't matter whether they're friend or enemy, foe or, or difficult, we're going to love them and we're going to show them kindness. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not. Yeah. Yeah, so Jutan Lind for her uh, and uh, make her a, a central figure in your Tang Lin. Again, not expecting that to have an immediate effect. We don't do practice uh, like we push a button, expect something immediately back. It doesn't work that way. But doing Tang Lin uh, in the long term, we are assured by our. Uh, lineage masters that that will be helpful. Well, thank you. We have one minute left. I don't know that. Um, you're welcome, sir. Uh, I ask uh, Sue Erlewine to give uh, sort of the ending to this talk. Uh, are you there, Sue? Yes, I'm here. I had to find the mute button. So, so um, uh, we have a passage that I think sort of sums up what we want to say, rather than me saying it. Would you like to read that? Yeah, this is um, from Chagda Toko Rinpoche. Every religion has its own teachings on the nature of death and its own methods for dealing with the death transition. My teachings come from an unbroken lineage of Buddhist meditation masters that extends back more than 2,500 years to Shakyamuni Buddha. The teachings of these masters have enduring re relevance because they are based on actual meditative insights into the passage of death and because they consistently relate death to life. Buddhist masters see death not as an isolated event, but as one more change in a never ending cycle of changes. Those who hear Tibetan Buddhist teachings on death had the fortunate opportunity to learn to use their mind's power to direct these changes and to gain control over their lives and over death. Death is a potent reminder to use life well. Always recognize the dreamlike qualities of life and reduce attachment and aversion. Practice good heartedness towards all beings. Be loving and compassionate no matter what others do to you. What they will do will not matter so much when you see it as a dream. The trick is to have positive intention during the dream. This is the essential point. This is true spirituality. Time is very precious. Don't wait until you're dying to understand your spiritual nature. If you do it now, you will discover resources of kindness and compassion you didn't know you had. It is from this mind of intrinsic wisdom and compassion that you can truly benefit others. Moment by moment, we should look at life as if it were a dream unfolding. In this relaxed, more open state of being, we have the opportunity to gain the infallible means of dying well, which is recognition of our absolute nature. If you wear robes, shave your head, 
pray on your knees every day, and yet become more angry, proud, righteous, and hard to get along with, you are not practicing spirituality. You must practice the essence, which is selfless love and compassion, and then try to help others to the greatest extent of your ability. Use all your resources of body, speech, and mind. This is the method. Whether you're Christian, Hindu, Jew, or Buddhist, love and compassion are the same. Victory over faults and delusion leads with victory over death. My wish for each of you is that you attain all qualities of compassion and wisdom and the ultimate deathless state of enlightenment. So uh, we're, we're a little bit, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sue. That was very well read, thank you. So we're, we're concluding here now. Um, the feeling I'm leaving you with is one of extreme gratitude. I thank you so much for being with us on this journey of the mind. Um, and I, I wish you all the best. And uh, we'll, we'll, maybe we'll meet up again in, the, uh, in a discussion about the bardo. So what we do as Buddhists is we wind up dedicating the merit of what we've done here today. Think, just asking questions is contemplating the Dharma. So thank you for your questions so much. So let's end with a dedication. Well, I'll say it in Tibetan first and then I'll read it in English. Sonam de Tamshe Jipani. Topne ni Pedro non pancheni, Kaiga nachi palap tupai, Sipe soles, drowa drowa show. By this virtue, may we become enlightened and having vanquished all negative influences, liberate all beings from this ocean of existence, which is clouded with the waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. Again, thank you so much and uh, look forward to seeing you again. Bye-bye now. Thank you, Lama Tana. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lama Thank you, Lama Tom. Thank you, Lama Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Lama Tom. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.